Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Pat Majitti, and uh, it is my honor to serve as Villanova's provost. Uh, and I am so excited uh, to, to welcome you this evening for the launch of the Ann Welsh McNulty Institute for Women's Leadership. This has been a long time in the making and something that your very attendance shows how important and necessary this initiative is. Uh, for those of you that attended the Villanova University Leadership Summit earlier today, I hope you enjoy this conclusion. And I see so many of you did stick around. And again, validation of, uh, of tonight's important event. The Ann Welsh McNulty Institute for Women's Leadership is an interdisciplinary initiative, meaning that it will serve the entire Villanova community. Students, alumni, parents, faculty, staff, and friends will have the opportunity to engage with and benefit from the McNulty Institute as it fosters women's advancement through education, advocacy, community building, and the collaborative creation of new knowledge. Many people have been involved in the founding of this important institute. First and foremost, thank you to Ann Welsh McNulty for your extraordinary gift that made this institute possible. <clears throat> The development this, of, this, of this institute has really been a community effort, and I'd like to thank uh, the steering committee and the search committee for the many hours they spent over the past two years laying the groundwork for this important institute and finding the ideal candidate to lead the charge as the founding director. I especially want to recognize Dr. Amy Fleischer. She's chair of the mechanical engineering department, and she chaired both, committee, both of those committees and has demonstrated the type of leadership we hope to cultivate through this important institute. Dr. Fleischer has spent many hours, day and night, to bring us where we are today. So thank you, Amy. <clears throat> As we look ahead to the next steps for the McNulty Institute, we are fortunate to have several accomplished leaders from various industries serving on the Institute's Advisory Council. These women will provide valuable insights and guidance as the Institute grows. We are proud to celebrate the culmination of all of these efforts tonight. It is now my pleasure to introduce the founding director of the Ann Welsh McNulty Institute for Women's Leadership, Dr. Teresa Boyer, an innovative leader, accomplished author, skilled researcher, and outstanding professor. Dr. Boyer comes to us from Rutgers University, where she served as executive director of the Center for Women and Work and an assistant research professor. Perhaps favorite to all of us, though, is that she's a Villanova alumna. I, I cannot tell you how thrilled we are to have Dr. Boyer at the helm, and we look forward to her vision and expertise in guiding the McNulty Institute for many years and great successes in the future. Dr. Boyer. Thank you, Dr. Majidi. I'm honored and humbled to have this opportunity to make such a wonderful contribution to my alma mater. What an exciting day. We had 420 people really interested in talking about women's leadership here today. Just amazing, and the enthusiasm in the room is continuing. I love it. <clears throat> One of the reasons why I'm so pleased to be here is because it was my experience as a student at Villanova that led to my choice of career in higher education. I was absolutely fascinated by the way Villanova created a space for my exploration of knowledge and physical, spiritual, and emotional growth. And that was the foundation for the leadership path that I was to take. And I wanted to be able to create that for others. And the more my experience of the broader world grew and the more I had to build on that foundation I had laid here at Villanova, especially as my understanding of the impact of gender on our interactions in education and the workplace grew. And I began to take on leadership positions which fulfilled my passion for making a difference. And so it was with great anticipation that I accepted my brother-in-law's suggestion over his visit during the last Thanksgiving holiday that we take a day trip to visit Villanova. Coincidentally, he was a Villanova alum as well, we're everywhere, and both of us had heard about the growth and changes on campus, and I admit it had been quite a while since I had been back. So I packed up my then three and six-year-old daughter and we headed out as our families headed over for a visit. And 
got onto campus and seeing the spires of St. Thomas of Villanova Church and wandering past the Oreo and Core Arch brought back all of those feelings. And I said to the group, you know, it's too bad they don't have a women's center here. <laughs> Not two weeks later, someone left the printout of a search description for director of a new institute for women's leadership at Villanova on my office chair. I have some colleagues from my former work here tonight, so I won't name the person. <laughs> and scrawled across the top was a, know anyone? As a firm believer in God's voice, here I stand. You will note that I mentioned Women's Center in my offhand comment um, on our visit here, but what came across my office chair was even better. The Ann Welsh McNulty Institute for Women's Leadership is not just the fulfillment of a dream job for me, but the vision of Ann Welsh McNulty, a trailblazing leader whose story we'll hear more about this evening, and many other Villanovans who are looking for a way to advance women leaders and institutionalize gender equity at the university and beyond. I've been thrilled by the hundreds of people within the Villanova community I've spoken with who express their enthusiasm and excitement at the potential of this institute and, I can, and that they cannot wait to be involved in some way. And now, as we see the daily news headlines, we know that advancing women leaders is as important as ever. As you heard Dr. Majidi describe of our mission, this institute is for all Villanovans, not just its women, not just its students. So men, I'm looking at you. At the core of that mission is the belief that gender equity is central to the common good. That is, when we create an environment where women leaders thrive, our societies thrive, our families, our children, our institutions, our economy, and more. That's a big mission but it's one we're well poised to tackle. That's because it is in keeping with the Augustinian tradition of self-understanding in the pursuit of a just and peaceful world. And why I find the Ann Welsh McNulty Institute for Women's Leadership at Villanova to be the perfect place to advance the work I've been doing for over two decades. It's now my pleasure to introduce Villanova's president, Father Peter Donahue. Father Peter is now in his 12th year as president, and under his leadership, Villanova has introduced new initiatives, enhanced its nationally recognized academic prowess, and broken university admission records, all guided by a visionary strategic plan. Villanova's upward trajectory has included the continued advancement of women. And today, there are more women in leadership positions at Villanova than ever before, including the deans of four out of six schools and colleges. And the launch of the McNulty Institute is yet another mark in the achievements made during Father's tenure. Please join me in welcoming Father Peter Donahue. Temporarily, Terry um, shares an office space in the president's office. And so she's learned that um, the job of the president in the office of the president isn't all that serious. <laughs> you know, we've had a lot of laughs over the last several months, so it's, it's been great. Good evening, and, and thank you all for being here. I, I've heard so many reports from people today that uh, the experience of today's lectures and panels and all the things that happened today were just amazing. So I thank you, everybody, for participating in one way or the other. On January 5th in 1842, a widow by the name of Jane Rudolph sold her estate to two Augustinian friars. She was forced to sell the estate to them because in 1842, a woman could not own property in her own name. And the Augustinian friars were interested in starting a center for Catholic and Augustinian education. Today, more than 175 years ago, that school has grown to become one of the top universities in the nation. And Jane Rudolph had no idea of the impact of her decision would make, of how many lives she would change, of the community now of more than 130,000 strong that would rise from the humble price of this land of the legacy that she would shape supporting Catholic and Augustinian education. Jane was simply called to do something good for the common good. 
She is the first in a long line of influential women who have ignited change at Villanova and around the world. Villanova women are CEOs, U.S. senators, coaches, judges, community leaders. They are deans, Olympians, research scientists, and brigadier generals. They, over in, they oversee and manage healthcare professionals. They are teachers, artists, journalists, and ministers. They balance relationships with life partners and family, where they are daughters, sisters, cousins, granddaughters, and mothers. These are the women we celebrate today as we launch the Anne Welsh McNulty Institute for Women's Leadership. The McNulty Institute is a powerful addition to Villanova University. It will be a resource for all Villanovans seeking ways to advance women's leaders. It will empower women and men to challenge the assumptions and enact social change. It will engage faculty and students in interdisciplinary research and scholarship that will just transform thinking and inspire action. It will honor our Augustinian traditions by promoting lifelong learning and developing leaders professionally and profession personally and professionally. And it will demonstrate to all men and women that in today's world, women can own just about anything. <clears throat> This year, as we celebrate 175 years since Villanova's founding, we also marked 50 years. It's 50 years ago that Villanova's Board of Trustees decided to expand enrollment, allowing women to pursue all disciplines at Villanova University. It is fitting that we mark this anniversary with the launch of an institute dedicated to the continued advancement of women, an institute named in honor of a woman who embraces opportunities and does not shy away from obstacles, a woman who has ignited change wherever she has gone. Anne and I attended Villanova at the exact same time. <laughs> we didn't know each other personally, but I knew who she was. Because Anne was the valedictorian of the class, she was the editor of the Villanovan, she was a, tired, a tireless advocate in pursuit of justice and e equity, and sometimes, uh, much to the chagrin of the uh, administration, Anne challenged them. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Anne during our 10 years on the Board of Trustees. She is an accomplished business leader, an avid philanthropist, and a dedicated Villanova alumnae. And with all of that, she is a daughter, a sister, a cousin, and a mother. She credits her family with all that she has achieved, and in return, she has helped many others to achieve. When she and I first spoke about creating an institute for women's leadership, I knew its formation would be like nothing Villanova has ever seen before. For more than a year, faculty and staff worked with the McNulty Foundation to create the guiding vision for this institute. That spirit of inclusiveness, the commitment to co collaboration, and that drive towards action are exactly what we seek to achieve through the McNulty Institute. And now I am very pleased to see Dr. Terry Boyer, another accomplished Villanova alumni, as turning this vision into reality. And I must honestly tell you that over the several months that Terry has worked here, she has done a lot. Uh, she has spent hours and hours and hours on the phone, and she is one of the best bakers of vegan products I have ever <laughs> experienced. None of this would have been possible without Anne's generous gift and enduring commitment to Villanova University. Anne, I want to thank you for this transformational vision, this transformational gift to Villanova. Because of you, um, Villanova and the Villanova women will never be the same. It is my pleasure to welcome Anne Welsh McNulty. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. That was wonderful. <laughs> and I get to win. You can win. Oh, so good. All set. Ah. Thank you, Father Peter. When Father Peter and I were at Villanova, the school was still getting adjusted to the idea of being a co-ed school. And even their attempts to embrace us as women on campus sometimes showed us how far we had to go. For example, someone had the great idea that we should have a new mascot to represent the girls on campus. It was girls back then, not women, the girls on campus. And this bright idea was the wild kitten. <laughs> now, if you today had to create a sexist mascot for a joke, <laughs> just for a joke, the wild kitten would not be far off. So just to give you the picture, the wild kitten would prance out to be next to the real mascot, the wild cat. And the difference is, she would have the same costume from here down, the, the furry costume, but then it was cinched at the waist and went into a flouncy miniskirt. And she had high black boots and black stockings. So, wow. Um, now for me, the, the plus side of this is I got to write what was really one of my favorite editorials for the Villanovan. <laughs> ah. Which I thought was very lighthearted and very funny. Um, in which I pointed out the rather obvious truth that wild kittens are not female wildcats. <laughs> you know, seriously, cats and kittens can be male or female. Now, the fact is, kittens are cuter, and they're smaller, and yes, by the way, they are weaker. Um, but nonetheless, in, in my editorial, which you see here, um, I did point out that having a wild kitten was not just sexist, but actually pretty silly. So, here we are now. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you the reaction to the... Uh, to the editorial, and that was, as any of you who have ever spoken out about sexism will recognize this response, you know, you have no sense of humor, you are really way too uptight, uh, and so on. But the women in my class said, wow, you know, we never really thought about it. And so, um, we did move forward to that. We got more responses to that editorial than any of my other editorials ever, um, and more responses from that. So today, we're here today, and we have really moved from this sexy kitten mascot uh, to this new and bold and exciting initiative for women, which really shows where Villanova stand, uh, where women stand at Villanova today. And creating this at Villanova, which is, by the way, one of the first institutes for women's leadership at any Catholic university. But creating it here is especially meaningful for me because we are a big Villanova family. Uh, so not only did my father go here in engineering, my uncles and Augustinian priests went here, uh, my sister Mary Rose was in the second year of classes in arts, and, or in the first year, sorry, first year of classes of that 50 years ago when women were admitted across the university. And all the rest of us followed her. So that includes me, two brothers, three sisters, eight in-laws, and many cousins, nieces, and nephews. An amazing number of them are right here tonight. Um, in addition to that, we come from a strong tradition of fierce women. Um, my grandmother was an Irish immigrant who used to admonish or, or, uh, all of us make yourself useful. And my demanding mother, who celebrates her 93rd birthday tomorrow, and she would be very annoyed to know that I mentioned her age. <laughs> so when I arrived here in the 70s, 
It really was a special time, a very exciting time. It was an optimistic time, a lot of energy, and the women here on campus then really believed uh, that we had unlimited opportunities, that we would storm out into all the different professions, and we would relentlessly, if not effortlessly, rise to the top of all these professions. Now, it didn't quite work out that way. We were ready for the world, the world was not quite ready for us. It wasn't just a case of leaning in. It wasn't just a case of working hard. And it wasn't even just having more women in the pipeline. Over the years, even when I ultimately was a managing director at Goldman Sachs, it was clear that there are systemic issues and that there are structural and cultural issues that impede women's progress. So today, once again, and Terry, you alluded to this, there is tremendous energy. You know, here today and more broadly, you know, it's a time of real challenges for women, uh, but also there is a, a time and a desire for real change. And I know all of you students out there in particular feel this. It takes a lot of work to believe in yourself. It takes work to step up and speak out, and it takes work to be a leader. So this institute is going to help women and men who want to change things. We are incredibly lucky today to have Dr. Anne-Marie Slaughter here with us tonight. Dr. Slaughter has been an outspoken voice on women's issues. In addition to being a world-renowned foreign policy expert, a expert in national security, I have heard her talk at the Aspen Institute and other places on those specific areas, and she is now head of the New America Foundation. So her very impressive bio is in your programs. Now, many of you will remember her famous story, Why Women Still Can't Have It All. And it had the most amazing cover on the magazine of an incredibly cute toddler stuffed in a briefcase. And that story is still ranks at the top of the most widely read articles ever in Atlanta Magazine. And at that time, it ignited a firestorm. I mean, passionate arguments, heated conversations, including among me and my friends. So I am proud and thrilled to welcome Anne-Marie Slaughter, who really has never stopped being involved in this conversation of how we, women and men can move forward individually and as a society. So let me welcome Anne-Marie. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry you had such an exciting time coming down. <laughs> Thank you. I think what Anne really meant was she is absolutely thrilled to have Anne-Marie Slaughter here tonight and not stuck on Amtrak, uh, where I have been uh, for the past 90 minutes. Did you know that it takes three hours to get from New York to Philadelphia? Uh, anyway, I couldn't be happier to be here, uh, and not just uh, physically, but it's an honor uh, to be able to address you and to be part of the opening of this institute. Uh, there are few things that make me happier in the world uh, than roomfuls of intelligent, committed women uh, and the men who support them. And as a lifelong professor, to see an institute like this one dedicated uh, to women's leadership. I was in my late 30s before I decided or even thought of myself as a leader. When I was in law school, and I was in my mid-20s, I was so frightened of public speaking that I didn't go into litigation, but only corporate. And well into my late 30s, my husband had to suggest that I put myself up to be president of the American Society of International Law. I was a tenured professor at Harvard Law School in international law. One might have said I had credentials for the task. It never occurred to me. So had there been an institute of women's leadership to say to young women like me in college, hey, 
you're a leader or you can be a leader and there are many different ways to lead and the world will be a poorer place if women like you do not live up to their potential, it would have been a great thing. And I couldn't be happier to see it uh, taking shape here at Villanova now. So what I'd like to do, and we're gonna have a conversation, Terry and I will have a conversation about many different things. I wanna reflect a little bit about leadership, uh, at my own uh, experiences, but also some of the scholarship. And I'm gonna start with the definition of leadership that comes from Nanuro Kohan. Couldn't have a better person for this purpose. Uh, Nan Kohan was president of Wellesley and then the first woman president of Duke. And she then wrote a book uh, called Thinking About Leadership. And she herself was a feminist scholar and a political theorist. So she has read the political greats and, and been a leader herself and given a great deal of thought. And her definition is that leadership, to be a leader is to clarify and determine the goals of a group of people and mobilize the energies to achieve those goals. So think about that for a second. Clarify and determine the goals of any group and then mobilize the energies to achieve that. Now, the first thing I think of when I hear that definition is how far it is from the classic image of the general on the white horse, which is the image of leadership many of us have. It's what we see in paintings. It's what we see in statues. We have this idea the leader is out front. Indeed, that's what distinguishes the leader and the followers. The leader's out front and the followers are behind. And the leader sets the direction and the followers follow. Hers is a very different def definition. In the first place, she assumes that there's a group of people. Anyone in that group could be a leader. And indeed, sometimes you have a leader at one time who's a follower at another time. What the leader does in that group is to be the person who helps that group figure out what they want to do. Now note she says clarify and determine. There's a big difference between those two. Clarify is a lovely consensual kind of verb where everyone just has a goal but they're just not quite sure what it is and this person sort of dispels the fog uh, and suddenly the goal becomes clear. I've chaired many, many meetings, and that rarely actually happens. <laughs> I'd like it to happen. I facilitate it in such a way that it should happen, but that and determine. Determine is a harder verb than clarify, and it means there's a point at which you have to say, okay, let's stop talking. What I hear is this. And then you essentially say, and if I'm wrong, challenge me. But that's, a, that's an act of more assertive leadership. But note, it's still not getting out front. It's indeed what I think of as leading from the center, that you're, you're in this group and you've clarified, you've then determined the goals, and then note, you mobilize the energies of the group to achieve it. And there are many different ways to mobilize goals. Sometimes it is getting out front or doing what I'm doing now, standing up front and inspiring people. Because inspiration, is part of mobilization. And sometimes it is really then figuring out the course that is best going to get that group to its desired destination. And that is more of our traditional view of getting up front, of, of determining for others. But mobilizing also means unlocking the power of each member of that group. It, when we think about mobilizing a movement, it is convincing people that they've got what it takes to get where they want to go. And that is, again, a much more horizontal definition of leadership. It's really about bringing people together and convincing them of their own power and then, then moving them toward uh, achieving those goals. So as I said, I think of that as leading from the center rather than uh, leading uh, from the front, although it, there can be an element of, of being at the front. It's also, as I said, it means you can be a leader one day and a follower the next. 
This is very important. Nan in her book gives the example of someone in a, home, in a group of homeless men in Providence, Rhode Island, who is the person that helps them decide what they need and how to get it. But he's just a leader in that one instance. And he then can be a follower at other times. You can't be a good leader without followers. And followership is actually something quite important as well. And the leaders who understand how to follow, and when I was the dean of the Woodrow Wilson School, I was a leader of my faculty, but I was a follower of President Tillman. She was my leader. So many of us as leaders have to do both, and it's very important to understand how to be a good follower uh, as well. Uh, the last thing I'll say there is that that definition is, says that to be a leader, you can't be afraid to use power. And that's very important. I often say to be a leader, you've got to be prepared to not be liked some of the time. You've got to be the person who's willing to take that decision even when there isn't consensus. And that's going to mean that some of those people who disagreed with you may not love you, uh, and you've got to just be prepared for that. Uh, so you do have to be able to use power. But if you notice the way she defines it, it's not just power over people, it's power with people. That idea of mobilizing the energies of a group to achieve a goal is power with one another as much as it is the power over other people. So that's sort of my favorite definition of leadership and I, re I recommend and I hope the McNulty Institute will take a look at thinking about leadership. Nan did not pay me for, for this uh, advertisement for her book, but uh, I know her as a friend and a role model uh, and I've, I've spent a lot of time looking at different definitions of leadership. But I also wanna talk about the connection between leading and caregiving. I wrote the article that Ann mentioned uh, and heard a great deal from great many people. Uh, I heard from men as well as from women. And I started to rethink some of my views. I mean, I wrote that article as, as someone who, uh, by that point, did think of myself as a leader. I, it was a it was an article aimed at a fairly a, a privileged group of people. If you're publishing it in the Atlantic, this is not People Magazine. This is a, a, a you know it's a pretty select group, and I knew that it was from a very privileged point of view. Uh, but I also definitely wrote it from the perspective of a woman who thought that having a career was more important than giving care to others. And I then spent three years thinking really hard about genuine equality between men and women and concluded, and I could not have said this when I wrote this article, that the importance of caring or the caring for others is every bit as important as providing for others by earning an income. When, before I wrote that article, I would have told you my mother's a professional artist, and I would have been very proud of that. And I am proud of that. She's a fabulous artist. I would not have said that she was a housewife or a homemaker or however you want to describe it. And yet, when I look at my own achievements and those of my brothers and my father, and indeed her grandchildren, the work she did caring for us and weaving that family together was just as important as her painting. And without that family, I cannot do what I do. The minute there's a problem, the grapevine goes out. I mean, we don't have quite as many slaughters as there are Welsh's, but, uh, <laughs> but it is that you know, we know when each other's in trouble, we support each other. That doesn't just happen. That is the work of somebody who gives care. I came upon a wonderful definition of caregiving from a man, a philosopher, a male philosopher writing in 1971, and it's a book called On Caring. And his definition of caregiving is investing in others so that you are as happy when they succeed as when you succeed. He actually talks about self-actualization through care. This is a, a man, he's a father, he writes about what it is to be a father, but he also writes about what it is to be an artist or a creator, and how when you give care, you must pour yourself into something or someone else, but you must also stand back and let that person take their full shape. I can say that as a mother, watching your child drive their car, your car out of the driveway, where every fiber in your being is screaming no, 
that's just one of those examples where to really be good at it, you've got to pour yourself in and you have to pull back. So I was giving a speech about caregiving to a group of, of very talented women, and a woman in the back raised her hand and she said, I'm a CEO and I'm a caregiver. She said, what you're describing is the way I mentor and nurture the people who work for me. Because as a CEO, my job is to unlock their talents and to empower them. Shortly thereafter, I was having one of those, what NPR calls, you know, the driveway moments where you pull in and you're still listening and you, you sit there. And I was listening to a, an interview with Dame Stephanie Shirley, who is a serial entrepreneur in Britain, and, and she's a dame because of her work uh, growing companies. And she said, I think about leading like growing my garden. I invest in people and grow them and I grow businesses. And shortly thereafter, I was with Barbara Byrne, who is uh, vice chairman of Barclays and a great figure among women in finance. And we were out in her garden, and she was with a group of, of women, and she made exactly the same point. She said, when I'm, what, the way I think about what I do is the way I think about growing my garden. I put in the seeds, I put in the care, I put in the investment, and then I let people grow, and I shape their path. But that's my job as a leader. So I think it's important, we often talk about work and family as if they're these two completely different spheres, and I suspect Terry and I will talk more about work and family and about the future of work, but I want to suggest to you that they're not that different. And you know, when you talk about nurturing or caregiving, that sounds very feminine, but for men, it's coaching or pastoral care. It is very much investing in others. A coach is just another description for a nurturer, a caregiver, a parent, a teacher, a nurse, a minister. Those are all the, the professions of investing in others, and much of leadership is about investing in others. So the last point I want to make about leadership, a sort of general definition and how we think about what it is, uh, how we think about uh, leading uh, as caregiving. And I should add, caregiving includes discipline, as any of us know, who are teachers or parents. If it doesn't include discipline, you're doing something wrong. So again, there's something, uh, there's, there's a strength there. It's not all, all uh, sort of soft love. It's hard love as well. But the last thing I want to say about leadership uh, is the relationship between leadership and integrity. I've thought a lot about this recently. Some of you may know I had a very rough September. I was on the front page of the New, in, of the New York Times in a less than flattering uh, depiction and spent rough weeks uh, with the press, talking to people, and I've spent a lot of time thinking about how you lead and be true to who you are, which I think means being true to your moral code. We talk about integrity. Integrity is a funny word. It doesn't have an adjective. There's no integrous. There's no, I mean, look it up. I often think about that. It comes, its, it's relationship is to integer, in, integer, right? Or integer, sorry, rather a whole number, being whole. So leading with integrity means not splitting yourself to be who other people want you to be. It means holding to what you think is right, but also admitting when you're wrong. It means standing up for principle and being prepared to bow your head when you realize you may have violated those principles. And it requires what I know the McNulty Institute will instill, because indeed Villanova instills it. And there are many times today when I think we wonder whether society as a whole has, has lost its moorings. It instills a moral code. A, I always say to my children, if you remember nothing else after I'm gone, I hope you'll hear my voice saying, do the right thing. And we may disagree about what's right or wrong in some cases, but there is a core moral code. 
And there is a, the set of principles that says even when, even when it hurts, even when you're being misunderstood, even when it would be so much easier to do the thing people want you to do, you have to know, you have to answer to that code. You have to do the right thing. So I couldn't be happier, uh, again, to be part of the opening of the M McNulty Institute. I am confident uh, that the leaders here uh, will learn to lead in ways that allow them to lead from the top, but also from the center. That as women and as men, uh, there will, you will come to understand the relationship between leading and nurturing and investing in others. And above all, that as leaders, you will have that code, and you will learn to it, stick to it. And it doesn't mean you're always right. Again, having a code means admitting when you're wrong, but you will know that you are whole people and that you will bring that to your leadership. Thank you very much. Okay. So thank you so much for that. Um, I think you definitely set the inspiration um, stage for us, and I have to tell you that I'm sure you know your way around a lavalier. <laughs> um, this is kind of one of those dream moments for me because I was teaching working women in American society and I used to have my students do an exercise where they took your Atlantic article and debated you. So, <laughs> so I'm actually gonna, no. <laughs> we're not gonna do that full um, exercise here because I think you've, it obviously was a critical piece that opened up and renewed a discussion around this issue. And I actually want to pick up on something that you talked about a little bit in your speech as well, which is this idea of criticism mm. and how when you wrote that article, as both Anne mentioned and you as well, um, it created this firestorm of discussion. And you were really poignant about how you talked about motherhood and, um, and the push and pull that was there. And you, you kind of put yourself out there <laughs> in that. And, um, and you took it. <laughs> um, and I'm curious about that and then what you were just describing about how a leader has to be willing to accept that criticism and how, as women, that's really risky, you know, something really that hard. we tend to really think about as we want to be liked, we want to be accepted. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that and also how we tend to criticize women in ah. the public sphere. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I often thought after the article, would I have written it had I known? Because I didn't say anything new, right? I wrote an article that had been written in certainly 1990, 2002. I can tell you the people who wrote the version of the article, and many women said, oh, gee, it's hard, right? <laughs> this is not new. And indeed, um, you know, the week before the article came out, The Atlantic couldn't get me booked on any TV shows because it was like, oh, come on, same old, same old. We've heard this before. But I hit a generational wave. That's what I'm convinced of, that daughters sent it to mothers, mothers sent it to daughters. A fair number of men said to me, my wife gave it to me, and there would be then this pause. And then they'd say, we had quite a discussion, which means we had a screaming fight, and it was your fault. Uh, <laughs> but um, I didn't expect it to, to do that, and, and there was a massive amount of criticism. At some point, I just stopped reading, right? You don't have to spend your day reading nasty blog posts. You really don't. It's just, and furthermore, you sort of think the people who have time to write them aren't necessarily the people you were writing for, so you think about that, too. Uh, but I, I was. I was kind of knocked off my feet, and, and um, you know, my mother sort of said, what have you done? Because I'd spent 25 years building a foreign policy career, and that was sort of wiped away in a second. But then I thought, but wait a minute, I wanted to, I wanted to ignite this debate. I wanted us to have the debate. That was the reason I wrote the piece was, you know, I've always assumed this, and I've now discovered that, and we need to come together and talk about this. So I concluded that um, it was worth it. When I would feel even the slightest bit sorry for myself, I would think, I spent two years working for Hillary Clinton. Now, you can love, love her or not, but she has gone through 
more criticism than anybody you know, and a huge amount of it deeply unfair. And I would think to myself, look, you know, this is just, this is just a tiny bit of that. And the important thing is to, that the de debate take place. And you do have to realize, and this is, I think, true if you're going to be a public figure, period, the people who know you, read, the people who knew me read that article the way I intended it. But of course, many people who read you don't know you. And they project whatever they want onto you. And you, that comes back to, do you know who you are? Do you know what you believe? Do you try to stand for what your code of principle as best you can? And that's really all you can do. Yeah. Oh, and the point about criticism, it, it, I do think that's harder for women. I think we are raised in way, or have been traditionally raised in ways that um, make it harder for us uh, to to be actively disliked. It's a, you know if you just think about how, when I think about how I make connections with people, I it's a kind of more it's it's again less of that out front and people follow, and it's much more I'm making connections and and working with people. So I do think it I think it's harder, but again. I also think women have unbelievable endurance and that when we're convinced that we're doing the right thing, watch out. That's right. <laughs> so we asked um, students, faculty, staff, some of my steering committee and others to submit some questions oh, for you. So I have a few of those from the different perspectives because as I mentioned earlier, the McNulty Institute is really supposed to be serving a wide variety of stakeholders. So I was curious what they would be asking you and we got some good ones. Um, and this one is from a student. Um, she said, I, I seem to be hearing breaking news every day about sexual harassment yeah. and um, the experiences of women in the workplace. Um, and it's a little freaky, right? Um, so how do I, and this is the student speaking, how do I prepare myself for the workplace given this situation? Um, so as I think you start by the idea that you're going to stand up against, you're gonna stand up for yourself and you're gonna stand up for others over any kind of harassment. So I do think there is sexual harassment, there's no question. I've not actually ever direct, directly experienced it myself in the workplace, but I've certainly experienced plenty of sexism and I certainly know others who have. And I do think uh, partly this next wave, it's going to get easier uh, to, to bring that complaint to human resources if you need to, to talk to others about it. I hope to talk to other women and men about it. But I think it's part of something larger, and I've been thinking about this a lot. <coughs> Harvey Weinstein, we're looking at, he was a bully. He was a bully to men as well as to women. He did terrible things to women, and that should never have been allowed, but I don't think he should have been allowed to be the person he was to men either. And I think it was all of a piece, right? He was enabled as somebody who, who said unspeakable things, who yelled at people, who humiliated people. That kind of behavior should have no place in a workplace. And if we think of, again, I'm not gonna say, oh, it's exactly the same, because obviously women are vulnerable in a different way, but I am gonna say there's a larger code, and I think it's easier for us men and women to say, this is the way you behave professionally, and if you step over it with women or men, we will, there will be consequences. Uh, so partly it, as in preparing yourself, prepare yourself as a woman, but prepare yourself as a human being to say, if I see this kind of behavior, I'm gonna stand up against it, whether it's against me or someone else, whether it's against a woman or against a man because humiliation and bullying are not acceptable. So your answer plays directly into a question from one of our steering committee members because this person said, one of the goals of the McNulty Institute is to cultivate an environment in which Villanovans speak out to challenge gender-based assumptions and advocate for policy changes leading to a better and more equal society. So what are the first steps to creating that environment? Because that's, that's a cultural change in a lot of ways. It is, it is. 
And indeed, we, those of us who study policy know that policy is important, but ultimately change comes from change social norms. So if we just think about cigarettes, and the younger people in this audience will have I mean, there is a sort of counter movement among some teenagers that it's cool again, but basically you've grown up with smoking is, is, is weak, it's, uh, it's dangerous, it's stupid. Well, I grew up with it was cool, uh, it was a sign of independence, it kept you thin. There were all sorts of great things about smoking. Uh, and uh, so... But what changed, so we had laws, we had taxes uh, on cigarettes, we had all sorts of policies and all sorts of laws, but ultimately it's the social norm that went from the Marlboro Man or Virginia Slims, sort of a cool image, to that person out on the stoop, you know, shivering in the cold trying to light up their cigarette. Uh, and that's where we're gonna have to go. Ultimately, male-female equality is about uh, people who grow up thinking of each other as equals and sharing, thinking about everyone sharing both the ability to care and nurture families, uh, whether constructed or biological, uh, and, and the, the wonderful excitement of being able to develop your own qualities uh, in, in whatever career uh, you choose. The way I think, um, so I think there are policy changes I, I would support universal family leave. I don't want to call it maternity leave or even paternity leave because many of us care for our parents rather than our children or for our spouses or for our siblings. We are human beings. We are vulnerable and sick and, and young or old. We need care. Our, our society should recognize that you shouldn't be fired for giving care to others. You should have, a, I, I actually think, a kind of budget that is available uh, to you, but certainly that workplaces should acknowledge. Uh, I think the best workers are those who care for others. I prefer people uh, who, who have you know, active actually families caring. or friends, <laughs> yes, who are, who are caring. So I think there's a range of things there. And again, uh, whether you call it leave or I would talk about support for elder care uh, and child care, flexible work schedules. Uh, but, but even deeper than that are the ways in which we help each other see the more subtle forms of bias. Mm -hmm. So the, the generation of women ahead of me, and actually, Anne, when you were talking about being here and the, the wild kitten, that was not <laughs> subconscious. That was not subtle. That's <laughs> bias right out there, and you could call it out. But often now, that's not true, right? Today, Villanova would not have the wild kitten. But still today... <laughs> Father Peter I'm said, I hope Father not. Peter. <laughs> um, but still today, I frequently encounter situations where men interrupt women, where women do not speak as long as men, and get. but you can tell that people are getting impatient if they just speak the same amount of time. I've been on TV where that's happened, and I can see people getting impatient. And I know that if you timed it, I've spoken less than the men around me. Or the famous... Um, what we call the butterfly problem, where a woman says something and it sits there like a caterpillar in the middle of the table, and a man says exactly the same thing, and it sprouts wings, uh, and you know is a brilliant remark. And those kinds of things, I have actually taken young men aside and said, you didn't notice this, but I assure you, every woman in the room did, and if you are going to both work with women and more importantly, uh, get the benefit of the full range of their talents, you need to be aware of this because these are more subtle ways in which women are still not being treated equally with men. And that you can't legislate. That's norms and it's consciousness raising. Right. Um, and actually your, your discussion about flexible policies and um, the uh, family leave issues is connected to a question from a freshman, a student who's a freshman, and she says um, she's very concerned about issues of work-life balance, and um, she wants to know from you, is, is it achievable? <laughs> and if so, are there certain fields that are better than others at um, helping us to get there? Ooh. Um. So I try not, uh, 
to use balance like a seesaw, right? Very rarely in my life has <laughs> things been perfectly e equilibrated. I ask the question, is it possible to have a fulfilling career and a family, and again, how you define family. We all have groups of people we love, uh, and whether you have children or not uh, is, is less important. You'll have children in your life, you'll have mentees in your life, but can you, can you find a life that has room for both things? And I think absolutely yes. Uh, I think that we need to ask that same question for men as well as for women, because many men wrote to me after my article and said, you think I chose this division of labor. You think that I want to be the breadwinner and not be able to go to my children's baseball game or to their play or be there when they need me. This was the role I was given, just as the caregiver role was the role women were given. I would like to break out of my role as well. And I believe that men may parent differently in some ways. My husband and I certainly have very different views often. But I think they want, they want and should be able to have the same range of choices around when you invest in others and when you invest in yourself. So what I would say is it is fully possible if you are committed to a very high powered career, and some of us are, I certainly have been, there will be times, and there may be, and when I say times, that can be you know, the three or four years your child is a teenager, for instance, as in my case, where you're going to have to make some trade-offs. You and your spouse are gonna have to make some trade-offs. So if your spouse, as mine was, is willing to be what I call lead parent, absolutely. Most high-powered men have a lead parent wife who is the person. It's very, you rarely see a CEO who's organizing play dates. It's just can be done, maybe, but that's an impossible standard. So what I would say is, yes, of course, but be realistic about what kind of career you want and what kind of relationship you expect to have with your spouse and be very honest about asking the questions about trade-offs. Then the question is, well, are there easier careers? Yes, I mean, if you're gonna be a doctor, being a dermatologist or a radiologist is easier than being a surgeon. On the other hand, I th think we'd be better off with many more women surgeons. So I don't think that the way to do this is to think, choose the career that allows me to have a family, I think you either want to say to your spouse, okay, I'm going to train to be a surgeon and there are going to be these periods where you're going to have to be in the lead. Or you think, you know, I'm going to lay in the foundation of this career. I'm going to take some time, not out, don't drop out, but you may need to defer some things and then I'm going to ramp back up. Or you might think, well, if I really want to do this, I can only have one child. But it's... The way to do this is not to put women in the family-friendly careers and men in the high-powered ones. That's not going to be equality. It's to put men and women into a mix. And that really <laughs> resonates with me, too. Starting this position and um, having it be a family discussion, my husband's here tonight, but it, it was a big choice. You know, will my husband take a bit of a back seat while I you know, move the family and have everybody exactly. follow me here. So I hear you on that. Um, and that actually connects to a question I wanted to ask you about the future of work. As you know, I used to be at the Center for yes. Women and Work at Rutgers. I'd done a lot of my own research and writing and, and talking on issues of work life. And, 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 and I, like you, avoid the balance term. <laughs> um, and it strikes me in that new report that I've seen uh, New America work on in terms of what the future of work looks like, uh, having more task-based right. work, um, stopping in and out, right. shifting gears, et cetera, is the reality that women have been working under in a lot of ways for decades. <laughs> and so I'd like to hear your thoughts. Do you agree with that? And is that something that you think poises us to be leaders for solving those issues in this new workforce that we're going to be facing? 
I do. So the, this project New America did with Bloomberg, uh, essentially, instead of looking at the future of work, like are the robots coming or uh, are they not coming or when are they coming, we tried to get a little more granular and we said, imagine four scenarios. So just think about, will there be more or less work overall in the future? And will it be more jobs or more tasks? So you can imagine more work and it's all jobs. That looks like the economy we've had and it looks very rosy. You can imagine less work and only tasks or more tasks and that can look like the Hunger Games, right? There's less work overall and the, the work there is doesn't support a, a, a family life. And then there's sort of the in-between, more work but tasks and I think that is quite likely in many ways or less work uh, all jobs, that looks a little like France. There's not enough work, but the, the, the people who have jobs are, are, are very lucky. Uh, <laughs> apologies to, and France is making lots of reforms, but that is, has looked like France. Uh, I'm not being diplomatic with my State Department training. So, uh, but I, so I do think we are moving to more tasks. And it is important to realize when people talk about that, they often think, you know, the gig economy, they think Uber or, or uh, you know, kind of task rabbit, the sort of uh, lower end jobs that do help lots of people fill in for extra income, but they will not support a family. But there's lots of higher end sort of chunking works. I sat down last week with a woman who runs the business talent group uh, in Los Angeles, and that is project-based work for lawyers uh, and CEOs of all descriptions and finance people. They have more men than women, and it's people who want to drive their own careers and work on their own time. So they set in for a project and they get paid extremely well, and they stop, and then they do something uh, like that when they're ready to work again. And we see younger people, and I look at my own children, and we say, you're gonna have nine, or t nine jobs by the time you're 50. Right? So that idea that you're going to be in one job and you're going to continue, that's going away. So that does look like a work landscape that many women have experienced, but not by choice. Uh, they've experienced it because that when they had children and they, needed, they wanted to work in a different rhythm, their, their boss wouldn't let them. So they had to find something else. And what did they do? Many of them set up as consultants, and that's project-based work. So in many ways, I think, yes, uh, women have been more flexible and adaptable to those kinds of rhythms because we've had to be. And as that becomes more the way everybody works, it will again get easier to say to your spouse, okay, you're not going to drop out. You're going to keep your skills sharp and you're going to gain new sh skills, but you need to work flexibly for this period while I take that job that requires me to travel all the time or be uh, really at a client's uh, behest all the time, and then we'll switch. So I think that it, that is quite positive. You know, it's gonna take a while to get there, but you can see the outlines. Um, well, and I'm afraid we're running out of time here, so I have my last question, which is another selfish one in terms of leading the McNulty Institute, and um, we've had a lot to think about tonight and lots of ranging issues around women and leadership. And now that we've launched this institute after years of planning, um, what should we be, what should be next for us? What should be the first thing that we tackle <laughs> as we start to put together our strategic priorities? Uh, in terms of, of, of teaching students or research? Or topics. Or topics. And, yeah. And wow. even research could be one of those, sure. <laughs> um, So I think, I mean, there are many, but I think I would come back uh, to where I started. I would, one of the key questions, and the minute you see an Institute for Women's Leadership, immediately some people focus on the women's and some people focus on the leadership. Uh, and you heard me start with a definition of leadership that did not say women lead differently than men. It was a definition of leadership from a woman leader, but she actually says in chapter four, she does not believe women uh, lead differently than men. So I think the place I would start is exactly what, how do we think about leadership? With a lot of women, but also men, I mean, you've got obviously your students, uh, your alumni, your faculty, uh, to, 
to hold to that definition in a way that I think brings what women bring to it. And as I said, I think it's easier for women to understand leadership as caring for others, lead leadership as investing in others. But I think many men do that too. But if you, you hold to a definition of leadership that women leaders can say, yes, this is me, but so can men, so that it isn't this is how women lead and that's how men lead, but rather women may have a better way of thinking about leadership for all of us. And this is a vision of leadership that all of Villanova and all of the McNulty Institute want to put forward. And as I said in my remarks, with a strong moral code at the center of it, I think that's a conception of leadership that our society badly needs. Wow, I couldn't have ended that better myself. <laughs> Thank you.